All right, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to raise the awareness of trauma and to support and inspire new trauma therapists just starting out on the trauma-informed journey. I do that with my membership community, Trauma Therapist 2.0, my online courses and workshops, and the Trauma Therapist newsletter. If you're a therapist of any kind and you work with individuals who've been impacted by trauma, I invite you to head on over to my website at the Trauma Therapist project.com that's the trauma therapist project.com all right let's get started all right emily are you ready to do this i'm ready let's go okay <laughs> <laughs> all right so five four three two and one all right folks welcome back to the trauma therapist podcast very excited to have as my guest today emily bernath emily welcome Hi, thanks for having me. You are welcome. So Emily has a passion for reaching out to women and guiding them to living out an identity rooted in truth. After being a rape survivor, Emily found her life quickly turn away from having everything she thought she wanted and towards feelings of both hopelessness and worthlessness. It was during that time, being open about her experience, that it became apparent to her just how many other people experience those same feelings and so easily allow things that aren't true about them to define them. Her writing career began from a passion of wanting to shift the culture in how we view other people. There is no one there is no one on this earth who God doesn't love and value dearly, and he calls us to see them in the same way. Emily rediscovered a relationship with God because someone made the effort to value her and lead her back to Christ and his love for us. She has since made it a commitment to do the same for as many people as possible. All right, Emily, welcome. Thanks for, thanks for doing this. Yeah, no problem. Anytime. All right. So before we get going here, share with our listeners where you are from originally and where you are currently. I am from Ohio, uh, and I moved out to Utah when I was 23. So. Okay. okay. Um, all right. So let's start. How, how did all this start for you? Uh, writing in general? Um, well, you're, it sounds like the writing started because something else, you had an experience yeah, I went through my own experience of sexual assault in college and, um, you know, really that caused me to face God in a different way than maybe I had before. Um, I didn't really have anyone to turn to. And so I turned my anger to God, God and was like, why did you do this to me? What did I do to deserve this? All those questions. Right. Um, and, um, you know, I didn't, I wasn't really taught growing up the importance of like having a personal relationship with God, nor did I know that was even something that was possible. Um, and so initially, you know, I turned back to, to drinking and worldly things that were, you know, got me out of my head, right? Like mm -hmm. they didn't solve my problem, but getting drunk for a night, you know, caused me for, to forget about my feelings for that night. And then, you know, you'd repeat the process again over and over right and that's how a lot of our worldly satisfactions come in they're they're only temporary right the only mm -hmm. so source of permanent satisfaction is god um but it was about i don't know three to six months after that had happened that someone uh became my friend and they invited me back to church and really just figured like i had nothing to lose because i had already lost a lot of friends and relationships leading up to that point um, of people who just didn't believe me or didn't support me in the way that I wanted them to. Um, and so instead of choosing to stay in those groups, I left. Um, and yeah, it was there that, um, you know, people did teach me about what having a relationship with God was like. And in finding that, um, got the healing that I was looking for all along. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where Okay, I just what? want to interrupt you for a second, if I may. How long ago did the sexual assault? Eleven years ago. Okay. Yeah. And you said when that ha you were in college. Yep. And you said you didn't have the support of people. People didn't believe you. Um, yeah. Got told it was my fault. You know all those things that survivors still today get told, unfortunately. 
Um, but that doesn't make it true, right? And so it's, you know, whether these people are telling me these things or not, I don't have to listen to them and believe them and take what they say as truth. Mm-hmm. Um, was and- there anyone, or, I mean, you said there was no one, but uh, I want to kind of press you here a little. Was there anyone who did believe you? Or Some people I think did, but we just, I mean, it, even in these last 11 years, the amount of awareness of like, um, you know, just support that exists out there for survivors has grown exponentially, Mm -hmm. like, um, which is awesome. And I think we still have a long way to go, but, um, even if people that did know, and they did believe me, they just, people aren't well versed in how to talk to people and walk people through those kinds of things and give them the help that they need. And so rather than getting them that help they need, they just kind of shy away. I don't know if that makes sense. Of course it does. And it sounds like you did that. And you also turned to alcohol, yeah. other things. And you met a person who you said kind of invited you back to church. Yep. What did you hear or experience there that shifted things for you? Um, yeah. I mean, I'll never forget one of the first like services I ever went to. This wasn't at like a specific church, but like a college specific ministry. Um, it was over Thanksgiving and I don't even know why, uh, but I just went up on the stage. We had, they had people going up and they were sharing what they were thankful for. Um, and really, I think I was just like, I'm just thankful to be here and to not be stuck in my, you know, my isolation that I had put myself in for the past however many months. Um, and afterward, I mean, I had person after person come up to me and they were just like, man, I'm glad like you're here. Thank you for coming. Like, I can't wait to get to know you better. And I was just like, whoa, this is weird. Like people, like they see me in my distress and like, I don't even know how to see myself in a positive light, but these people see something in me that I don't know how, but I want to know how, right? Like I I wanted to find that out and it got me you know, curious and wanting to get to know them better. Um, So it really wasn't initially me wanting to get to know God better, but these people knew who God was. And by them, you know, shining their light to me, it showed me like, oh, this is why they're like this, right? Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, so. So talk a little bit about how things progress from there in terms of your healing and the impetus for writing the book. Yeah. So over the next couple of years, it definitely wasn't something that happened overnight. Maybe for some people it is. For me, it wasn't. Um, But I had to be willing to uh, surrender over those things that I thought about myself and let them go, right? Like the more that I held on to that I'm worthless and nobody wants to get to know me, the like the more that becomes my reality, right? Versus the Bible is telling me, you know, that I'm loved no matter what, that my body is a temple for God, like God valued my body more than I valued myself. Um, And, you know, I had to be willing to say like, oh, maybe these things are true, right? Um, And accept a new truth about myself um, before, you know, healing could begin, right? Because as long as I kept my my current reality of I'm worthless and disgusting, like healing would never happen. Right. Because that would just constantly be my reality. And so once I was willing to entertain that there was a new way to see myself, then I was able to dig deeper into what that way was to get to know God better and to, to know his love for me better. Um, during During this time, did you seek out therapy of any kind at all? Not from like a therapist, human, no. Okay. And that was because why? I mean, I wouldn't even have told you where I could go or okay. what to do, or if I even had like the resources to sure. do that. I, I don't know. I was sure. a naive 20 year old. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, just out of curiosity, yeah. what, what was your experience uh, like? At, at school, you said this happened at school. Did you turn to any any administrative staff at school for help? Uh, yeah, like I said, nobody. I I didn't know what was even there. Sure, like, sure. 
So no, I didn't. Okay. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm just curious about your process. I'm not judging you in any way. Yeah. I'm just curious about how, <laughs> you, how things unfolded. Um, so you said when, when this experience did happen, you were like, you know, God, how could you do this? Blah, blah, blah. How did you reconcile that? Um, well, you know, it really took getting to know God's character better, but God wasn't actually the one that quote, did that to me, right? Like, um, you know, that's not how God and his love operates. Yes, sin exists. Um, bad things in this world do happen, but ultimately, like, God and sin can't, like, God is free of sin, and he's not the one that physically did that to me, right? And God, I fully believe, can use all things for good, so regardless of bad happening in the world, that's not beyond God's capability to bring good out of it. Um, and that's really where my writing began and my heart for, for women's ministry began because I, I didn't have a community of women that I wanted and I didn't have anything against men specifically. Maybe some survivors do, I didn't. Um, but I really did want a female to connect with and to talk to about with my experience and I, I didn't have it. Um, and so once I did find that community and those women that I could talk to, that was, you know, me making that commitment to be that for other women. And that's where writing came in. Mm -hmm. Um, as originally I just started writing to lead a women's Bible study at my house and that's all I wanted it to be. I never intended it to go anywhere <laughs> other than my living room. Um, if it was left up to me, that's where it would have stayed. Right. But that's not what God had in mind. And God multiplied my yes of just wanting to share this message with a few people into a lot more than a few people, um, which I'm grateful for. Um, but yeah, uh, that's kind of where it all started. Um, so let me just break in here. So we were talking about your book called Broken Lenses. Uh -huh. uh, Kirkus Reviews writes, uh, it's a Christian guide focusing on leaning on God during life's rock bottom moments. The heart of Bernath's sequel is a holistic call for readers to embrace the kinder and more uplifting aspects of the Christian faith, a positive, emotional, and straightforward manual on Christian coping strategies. So I really appreciate you coming on here because this is a, a, a perspective that I don't know a lot about. And I'm curious about how do you frame the, where is God? in relationship to this sexual assault? Like initially you said, you know, God, how could you do this? And, you know, now you're saying, you, now you said, well, you're understanding that, well, it's not God's fault, but where is God in this? I mean, to me, he's the ultimate healer. Um, you know, the wonderful counselor, the Prince of Peace, all of those things that are talked about in Isaiah. Um, so I, you know, um, I think, yeah, I think we search for a lot of things in and of from the world that will only give us this temporary solution that really we're just trying to fill, um, where God is actually meant to be. Um, yeah. And I, you know, don't necessarily ask like, definitely didn't ever ask for anything like that to happen to me but I also you know welcome the oppor all the opportunities that God has given me since then to bring light into the world and to help other survivors um and I wouldn't necessarily say I'd take it back either right because mm -hmm. um yeah I, I don't know it's a weird in between right it's like no, I didn't want this to happen, but I am grateful for the good that I get to bring from it. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I think a lot of this for me is, I mean, uh, you know, m many of us have different beliefs. Obviously we, we yeah. believe in different gods and um, have different relationships with that God. And I'm just curious about yours specifically you know is yeah do, do, so i do, i uh, something i do a lot of speaking on um i've gotten to speak at a few conferences now sexual assault uh like advocacy conferences and whatnot on the the spiritual impact of abuse um 
and as much as I think that there's a physical impact and a mental, right, you know, emotional for sure, um, I fully believe that we can't fully heal from trauma unless we address the spiritual aspect of it. Um, and that for me personally is where I found the most healing. Um, and at its core, even the word faith just means complete trust and mm -hmm. 85 to 90% of uh, survivors are abused by someone that they trusted, right? And so just by definition, it's like when someone that I had trust in or, you know, i.e. faith does something to me that is like inexplainable, right? Um, such as sexual assault, it, it causes you to think like, I don't know what to have faith in. I don't know who to trust anymore. I don't, so there's all that breakdown of this, this spiritual aspect, whether it's God or whatever, right? Like we have to be willing to give survivors a space to explore like how to trust people again and what they can believe. And um, I think as advocates that we definitely have the power to be, to hold that space for them, to give them a safe space, right? someone that they can trust, someone that they can confide in. But and what no, was, I don't want, but what, what was your belief? How did you manage this? I mean, you know, I, 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 interviewed a lot of combat veterans for uh, my dissertation when I was in graduate school on the topic of PTSD and meaning. And just as you're saying, uh, uh, probably down to the very last one, a lot of the people I talked to said, you know, how the heck could God have allowed this to happen to me? Um, so they really had a, a shift in their whole world view, but w Emily, I want to get really specific about how, what did you say to yourself? How, w where did you place God in this? I mean, as far as in the moment, I would have placed him like in heaven, like condemning me of like, oh, you like like what I was saying, what did I do to deserve this? This So blaming sense, you, but... this was, you deserve this basically. Initially. Yeah. Okay, but right. over time it turns into, Oh, God was actually the one when, when I had nobody to turn to God was there and he was sitting with me and he was with me in that moment. Um, and which is the truth, right? Like God isn't sitting in heaven, just like shaming me shame is not from god like condemnation does not come from god none of those things do whether we place them on him or not those things do not um and so it really took me getting to know the truth about who god is god is a god of of mercy and grace mm -hmm. compassion right like of love and um until i could get that right viewpoint of who god was i couldn't truly see him for how much he had done for me to heal me from from what had happened right mm -hmm. like so you your understanding came more from the healing that happened afterwards yeah than his 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 role in the actual event yeah okay well now when you're speaking at these conferences what are you hearing from other survivors what are they saying in terms of their relationship to god what is what's your experience in that sense um, so far, my experience has been like really well received. You know, I even after one conference had a, a Muslim woman speak to me is like, thank you for sharing like this. You know, I totally resonated with this. And that's my goal when I'm speaking. I'm not trying to push a certain faith on someone, but sure. the fact that we need to address faith in our healing as survivors or we're never going to heal fully. Right. Um, right. Because you know, we all choose to exercise our spiritual part of our life differently, but it's important to have. And whether it's in another human being or in my technology or in God, we all place faith in something, mm -hmm. right? Like we're trusting something and choosing to put our faith somewhere. And so, you know. So yeah. what, what was the impetus for writing the book, Broken Lenses? What was that? What, why did you write the book? Um, and how, yeah, did that, I mean, how did that come about when you said, I want to write a book? <laughs> I didn't want to write a book. I never wanted to write. <laughs> that was not my idea. No, I, I wanted to lead that small group in my house. And I just heard one day God say that if I wanted to do that, then I had to start writing. 
Um, and so it took me a couple of months before I like engaged in the idea and sat down and started writing. But um, I was committed that that was something I had wanted to do. And the joke's on me because the group I initially started writing for never happened. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I if God would have told me just, hey, Emily, I want you to write a book, I wouldn't have said yes, right? Like, I, I would have said no, because that was never in my interest. God knew that leading this group was in my interest. And that is what got me to say yes, because I was at least somewhat invested in, in part of what I thought I was saying yes to. <laughs> um, well, you, you did write a book. I did. I wrote a couple. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now what we're talking about broken lenses here, who is this book for? Um, so, you know, the heart in my writing is that when we know the truth, the truth will set us free. So that's, you know, I don't think you, I personally am not a nominational Christian woman, but I don't think you have to come from that mindset to get something out of the book, right? The first book is a lot of truths about um, identity, who am I, how does God see me, and how do I see myself in the same way? The second book is more, how do I see the people around me with the idea that, you know, when I see them as God sees them, it brings unity, and when I see people the way the world tells me to, it brings division, and really that power of this unity division contrast is in my hands, um, and so I think, you know, anyone that wants to, uh, you got to want to I don't know, engage. There's a lot of questions and reflection in, in each of my books um, with the intent that you're going to explore what that looks like for you, right? Like I can't, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So it, in kind of going back to uh, the Kirkus Review um, kind of thumbnail, they said um, it's a holistic call for readers to embrace the kinder and more uplifting aspects of the Christian faith, positive, emotional, and straightforward manual on Christian coping strategies. Okay. So in terms of your experience, your sexual experience, what do you share with other people? What can say survivors take from this? Yeah. So, I mean, in each of the books, I do talk about my experiences being a survivor and um, in book one, it's more that personal aspect of how I saw myself and how, as I learned the topics that the book talks about, how I learned to begin to see myself differently. And in the second book, taking it more on that outward approach of how I saw the people around me differently, right? So not only did I see myself as someone that wasn't worthy of love anymore initially, right? But I also didn't expect other people to love me either, right? And I, I put this false expectation on the people around me and they don't, they didn't deserve that. Like that wasn't true, right? Really the people around me, they were exhibiting the things that I talk about in the book. They were, you know, when I went and engaged in those uh, small groups that I was mentioning earlier, they saw me as belonging. You know, they, they said, I'm glad you're here, right? And in my head, I couldn't wrap my mind of how they, like how that was possible. <laughs> And so talking a little bit about that struggle and breaking down those lies of like that people couldn't see me as someone who was worthy of having a place anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. um, because I didn't think I deserved a place. Um, so yeah, I, I do mention my, my healing and applying the topics in the book to uh, you know my journey as a survivor as well. Prior to the assault, what was your belief? What was your state of mind? Did you feel like you belong? Did you? Yeah, I never really struggled growing up with like having a friend group. God bless me with a lot of really great friends from, you know, the age of five on. Um, and, and I kept those friends all throughout my childhood. I never really, I guess, lost friends, only gained more. And that was, you know, a complete blessing. Um, and so that was never really something I struggled with was having a place or people that, you know, uh, you know, wanted to be around me um, until then. Yeah. Um, so. Um, I, I asked about therapy uh, kind of in the aftermath, in the, in the wake of the assault. What about recently or since then? Have you ever sought out therapists of any kind? Um, no, I have not. Okay. But I, 
yes, I've spent a lot of personal time with me and just God and my like many, many tears, you know, <laughs> honestly, I was personally was never quiet about what happened to me. I know a lot of survivors are, um, you know, apprehensive to share their stories and, you know, to each their own. I, I personally never was just because I expected people to believe me really um, and found out quickly that that wasn't what was going to happen. But, no. um, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, I thought initially writing my story in my books was going to be pretty easy just because I was used to sharing my story. Um, and found out quickly that I was wrong, <laughs> uh, that there was something about just releasing my story into my books and not being in control of who sees it or who reads what. Um, it was definitely a further act of surrender than I had to do before. Um, and I couldn't even think about writing my story in my books without crying, let alone actually writing it. <laughs> and so I found a lot of healing in that. Um, you know, so not to knock the value of like professional therapy or anything like that. It's just, um, you know, I wrestled with my trauma in different ways. And sure. And I, and I totally respect that. I mean, I, 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 I'm, believe me, I'm not here to uh, say one person needs to heal this way or that way. You know, on this podcast, we obviously we talk a lot about different therapeutic modalities and, um, you know, whatever works for you. Yeah. Is, a lot is, of praying, a lot of meditating. It's fine. I'm, I'm just here to ask questions because I'm really curious yeah. about, about how you work through this. Yeah. A lot of being willing to, to sit in the pain and process it and, and write it down in a coherent manner that someone else could understand and get something out of it. it takes a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it also, takes a lot of courage i think you know you you uh, what you did the way you went through this and, and writing and not wanting to write kind of it takes a lot of courage and a lot of guts to do this i really admire you thank you so where where are you now what's happening for you now um let, let us know share share that with us yeah, well, uh, I knew pretty early on that Broken Lenses was a three book series. And so I am writing the third book. Um, I'm getting close to done. My goal is actually to finish by the end of April. I have the next two weeks off of work and uh, plan to do a lot of writing. <laughs> so hopefully at least the drafting portion of that will done and I'm, I'll have to do some edits to it. But mm -hmm. um, I do have plans for a book after this series is over and I would like it to be more specifically for survivors. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really know what that looks like yet, but I do. I feel God opens the most doors for me in that space. And I want a resource specifically for survivors. Whereas these first three books aren't like, I think survivors can get something out of it, but that wasn't my intent target audience when I started writing it, if that makes sense. It's, it certainly does. And what do, Emily, as we kind of close out here, what would you say to people listening, survivors who are listening, who are struggling with uh, maybe their own faith at, during this time, as you did too? Yeah. Um, you know, I think my biggest thing for other survivors is that like anyone who thinks it's okay to hurt you like that is not worth you spending their your time like forming your identity off of right like they clearly don't see you for the value that you hold um and so um you know my hope is that survivors just know how loved and how valued they are and that no one human being can take that away from you how no matter how much you try right mm -hmm. um and that there is a god that loves you regardless of how you see yourself um and wants to get to know you and have a relationship with you um all you got to do is come to him, right? <laughs> As is, you don't have to put on a mask or, you know, a front to be someone who you're not, right? Like God wants that authenticity. He wants you to come as you are. Um, and so, yeah. Awesome. Well said. All right, Emily, where can people reach you? What's the best way? Uh, author wise, I'm probably the most active on my Instagram account, which is at Emily Bernath author. I do have a website, uh, 
at emilybernathauthor.com, Facebook, and Twitter as well. Okay. So. Awesome. We'll have that linked up at the show notes page at the trauma therapist podcast.com. Emily, thank you so much. Um, again, yeah. really admire your, your courage to move through your experience, your, your sexual assault, the way you did and to come on here and share it. And I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. Be well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for listening and supporting this podcast. And if you'd like to join the hundreds of other therapists who are each month keeping up to date and informed and inspired about what's going on in the world of trauma, I'd love to invite you to head on over to the Trauma Therapist Newsletter. That's the traumatherapistnewsletter.com.